and the world is happening on Wall Street. Economic indicators. Who knows where this is going to end up? To understand the economy, you have to understand human nature. Welcome to the David McWilliams podcast. I hope all is well and you're doing fine the tail end of the summer. It's David here, obviously. The podcast, as you know, every week tries to make economics a little bit more intelligible, a little bit less complicated, and hopefully more relevant. This week, we're going to talk about Brexit, but from the Irish perspective. And what I mean by that is the relationship between Ireland and Britain, because it's very, very clear now that the new British tactic is to identify Ireland as the weakest link in the European chain and to put enormous pressure on Ireland, in actual fact, to put huge economic pressure on Ireland, uh, so much so that we will break ranks uh, on the backstop and ultimately we will facilitate the Tory right wing. This podcast is going to try and put some manners on that argument. And by that, I mean, try and explain why the Irish economy is considerably stronger, considerably less dependent on the UK. And ultimately, it is not in our long-term economic interest to side with the Brexiteers at this stage. Before we begin, I want to just mention that this episode is brought to you thanks to our Patreon supporters. And to help support the content, and perhaps more importantly, to unlock exclusive comment and scenes and footage and episodes, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com forward slash David McWilliams. I'm joined as always by my old mate, John Davis. How are you, Head? I know it's early morning for you. It is an early morning for me. I'm not a morning person, as you know, but anyway... Let's start with this. We must recreate the European family in a regional structure, called it may be the United States of Europe. And the first practical step would be to form a council of Europe. If at first all the states of Europe are not willing or able to join the Union, we must nevertheless proceed to assemble and combine those who will and those who can. Let us be frank with ourselves. There is on all sides complaint, criticism and suspicion, while the vital international problems of the day, problems which touch the very existence of our people, are being shelved or postponed or ignored. No country that values its independence and indeed its self-respect could agree to a treaty which signed away our economic independence and self-government as this backstop does. Uh, without the backstop, there is no withdrawal agreement, there's no transition phase, there's no implementation phase, and there'll be no free trade agreement. So, Mac, we're now what? Just a, a couple of months away from D-Day, Brexit D-Day, as it were. And now with Boris Johnson, who sees himself as a Churchillian kind of character in power, it's been interesting to see the kind of change in tone of the British press, particularly the Tory press, kind of demonising Ireland, being a lot more aggressive, finger-pointing, blaming us for being inflexible and all that. What's your take on that? Give us your take. Well, it's interesting. If you just hear that last clip there, you've got De Valera and Churchill, you've Johnson and Varadkar. These are four very, very different people with four very, very different worldviews and world experiences. And I'd argue that De Valera and Churchill were very, very similar. De Valera right. and Churchill were born in the Victorian age. Yeah. They were born in an age when Britain was the biggest economy in the world. It was the most powerful country in the world, and we were its first colony. And consequently, Churchill and De Valera's worldview is entirely informed by that. Johnson's worldview is informed by the fact that he was born in a declining country. He was born in the 1960s in Britain, which the empire just peaked. And ever since then, they have been trying to find a role in the world post-empire, which they can't really figure out. And the background noise has been the collapse of British power and the ongoing yearning to go back to a Churchillian, almost Victorian world yeah. where they were the top dog. Yeah. Faradkar is a man born in 1979. His father is Indian. His mother is Irish. He is born into a country that actually in 1979 probably begins this upward momentum which we've seen for the last 40 years. 
So his worldview is informed by being in a country which is actually going somewhere positive for the first time in nearly 200 years. Consequently, also the fact that his father is Indian, he's coming with probably not a great love of the British Empire, given that his father and his mother on both sides would have been colonized by people, by Churchill. But sure. more importantly, he's a modern individual. Yeah. He's a gay man. He's an immigrant. He's got a totally different worldview. So consequently, what you're seeing now is not, if you want to talk about the individuals, are various different worldviews where actually Johnson is kind of backward. He's a little bit like Churchill and actually not unlike De Valera, who yeah. are both of similar view. And for Radker, and most of us Irish people are much more modern now and forward thinking. That, I think, is a really nice framework to look at what's happening in Ireland, the discussion between the Brexiteers and ourselves, and the fact that, as you say, the British Tory press has decided to go for Ireland. So ultimately, look, the British tactic now, it's like a hostage situation. Johnson is the kidnapper. The backstop is the ransom. Ireland is the hostage. And what Johnson's saying to the EU is, you change the backstop or we will kill the hostage in a no-deal shootout with you. That's their <laughs> tactic. That's it, okay? It's a lovely so way once, to sum it up. <laughs> but, but, but that's it. So we are the hostage in this situation. Now, the question is, if you are the hostage taker, you have to think that you can actually kill, not just wound, but kill the hostage. And you have to think that the hostage is sufficiently weak to plead with the EU not to go through with the no-deal shootout. That has to be your framework. And this is what I want to talk about, John, because I think that the Brits not only have miscalculated, but so deep is their lack of understanding, lack of appreciation, and lack of basic knowledge about not just the EU, but more importantly about modern Ireland and the modern Irish economy, that they are playing the hand of a Churchillian, almost colonial person at a time when Ireland and the UK are actually not so much dependent on each other, but actually in competition with each other in terms of trade, in terms of capital, in terms of talent, etc. So let's look at it in that way and take the big historical view. Well, if you're right about the hostage situation, let's hope we don't fall victim to the Stockholm Syndrome. Well, they could do, but let's leave the Stockholm Syndrome for a minute. The last couple of months, I've detected something which I would call Britsplaining. Now, Britsplaining, you know what mansplaining is? Mansplaining is when a man comes to a woman, spreads his legs, man spreads, and explains to the woman about feminism. That is mansplaining. Britsplaining is when a Brit comes to Ireland, having no knowledge about Ireland, and sits down and explains to us what's best for us. And that's the sort of way the Tory press are behaving. So Britsplaining is based on a total misunderstanding of what is going on with the relationship, with our knowledge of them, their knowledge of us, and ultimately their power. Now the question is, where does this come from? And I think it's important to look at, and I don't want to go on for ages, but a 200-year history, potted history, of Irish economic relations with the United Kingdom. Because that's the framework of which the Brexiteers are basing most of their arguments. One argument which I heard the other day was that a guy called Lord Digby Jones, who sounds like a makey up person, but apparently was the head of the CBI in the UK, uh, which is the Confederation of British Industry, so he's no... Egypt, apparently. Yeah. Uh, he said uh, blithely that Ireland does 90% of his trade with the UK. Ireland does 11% of our exports with the UK. So they've no sense of what reality, but where does it come from? And what I want to do, John, is talk a little bit about the history. There's four big events in Irish economic history which we want to look at. One is the Act of Union in 1801. One is yeah. the famine. One is partition. And one is Ireland on the eve of EU Accension, let's say in the 50s, 60s, 70s, just before that when we started to negotiate. The first one is if you look around Dublin now, John, look around Dublin, look at all the big buildings. Look at Trinity College, look at the Bank of Ireland, look at Dawson Street, look at Dame Street, look at O'Connell Street, look yep. at all those extraordinary buildings. And what they tell you is that at some stage, Ireland was doing extremely well. Because no, in the same way as the Roman Empire delivered great buildings, all countries that are successful deliver great architecture. There's a legacy of something happening. And what you see is that all of Dublin was built between about 1720 and 1800. And between 1760 and 1800, 
the Irish economy was doing extremely well. Now, granted, it was under a Protestant ascendancy. Granted, it was under a system of government which didn't allow Catholics to vote, except all that. But just look at the economy. It was incredibly diversified. It was exporting to all over the world. Huge trade links with France, huge trade links with what became the Benelux afterwards. It had amazing trade links with America. And this was a country going somewhere economically. And of course, Dublin's architecture is the architectural fruit of a booming economy. So the Act of Union comes in. Our history books tell us the Act of Union was a direct response to the 1798 rebellion, that basically the Brits panicked, which could be the case. But what it did do, it began the slow strangulation of the independent Irish economy. So the Act of Union... No great streets or buildings were built in Dublin after 1801. That's the fact. Nothing was built in Victorian Dublin apart from Ranala, Rathgar, and a couple of the suburbs north of the city. But no big municipal endeavours. Why? Because the economy was beginning to be strangled by London. And that, of course, was part of the strategy. And the strategy was to keep the Irish subjugated because you know what? When they are independent, as they were in the 18th century, not only do the peasant Irish feel like revolting, but even worse, the mercantile class who led the 1798 rebellion feel like revolting. So we've got to get rid of those people as much as possible. Yeah, that was in around the same time as Peterloo. Uh, It was something I was reading about last week because it was the 200th anniversary of it. And it was a protest by the working class when I think it was... 60,000 people came out onto the streets of Manchester. So what the British government did was they sent in the cavalry. They killed 16 of them and injured something like 500. And the response from the British government was that these working class people didn't have the ripened wisdom to vote. And it was just interesting, somebody drew the parallel between the ripened wisdom of the working class in the early 19th century and the ripened wisdom of the voters in the Brexit referendum in 2016? I think it's a a fair fair comparison. But uh, if you look at Peterloo, 16 people are killed uh, and you compare that to what would have happened in a similar uh, situation in Ireland, which would have been thousands would have been killed. So I've always thought that, you know, the next issue, the first issue is the Act of Union. Then, as you say, with Peterloo, you have all this industrial working class coming in looking for a little bit more franchise and looking for a little bit more power, looking for a little bit more representation, looking for higher wages. That's going on in England. What's going on in Ireland at the time is the population goes from 5 million to 8 million. In 1840, John, Ireland had three times the population of the Benelux countries, which is Netherlands and Belgium together. In 1900, 60 years later, Ireland had three times fewer people than the Benelux. So this is the second big issue in economic history, which is the famine. And it's not just the famine itself, but it's the calamitous echo of emigration that destroys the entire fabric of the Irish economy south of Ulster. And we can't get away from the fact that the Act of Union, followed by the famine, are two unbelievably calamitous events for the Southern Irish economy. All of this we're talking about is feeding into the Brexiteer view of what Ireland is, which is a backward society uh, characterised by farmers and peasants and people eating potatoes and what have you, right? The third big issue, of course, then is partition, because partition happens at a time when, and it's really important to appreciate this, in 19. 21, when the country was partitioned, 80% of the economic output of the entire country came from the three counties around Belfast. So the only industrialized part of the country was Belfast. So not only do you have the famine destroying the southern economy in terms of the agricultural economy, but you also have at the same time, to talk to your Peterloo idea, the rise of an industrial working class in the north, who are both industrially working class who are religiously different, culturally different, and deeply, deeply separate, and empowered by the fact that they are much, much richer. So therefore, a partition, the southern economy, which was described usually as, it's a really nice describe, it was kind of a beer and biscuits economy. 
The only industrial we had was basically biscuits, Jacob's, Jacob's biscuits and Guinness, both of which, it's true, actually, yeah. both of which were derivatives of agriculture, whereas the North is building the Titanic. So these are totally, totally different industrial infrastructures. Yeah. And then the fourth bit is to look at Ireland just before EU accession or 20 years before EU accession. In 1953, when Churchill was Prime Minister of England for the last time, 97% of all Irish exports went to the UK. This is wow. unprecedented for an independent country. Incredible. So what you have, John, is the economic history of total emasculation of Ireland up until the 1970s, with yeah. this huge domination of Britain, massive emigration after the famine, the Act of Union taking away self-governments, then partition taking away the industrial part of it and giving it to, to the UK or to Northern Ireland. And you have this really dependent country, which in the 1950s, we forget, half a million people emigrated from Ireland to England alone in one decade. So it was really a independent country in name only. It was an entirely, it was still a colony. We were still a colony of the UK up until, economically I'm talking about, up until the 1970s. That seems to me to be the Ireland that the Brexiteers are talking about when they talk about bringing them to heel. Well, that view has become patently obvious over the last while when listening to some of the supposed learned MPs. That's their understanding of Ireland. That's their understanding of Ireland because they don't do much history in school. Yeah. They certainly don't do much Irish history in school. And they are living, it seems to me, off a worldview which probably ends sometime in the 1960s, when Britain is at the peak of its power, but beginning to decline, the 1950s and the 1960s. Yeah. And that's why it's all informed by all this D-Day stuff and fight them on the beaches and all that malarkey. That is where we start, John. That is where we start looking at Brexit. Yeah. And, and the fact that now the British press has decided that Ireland is the weakest link. So in that case, are they choosing to ignore the facts? Talk us through some of the stats, some of the trade figures. Okay, it's not that they can't, they're choosing to ignore, John. They just don't know. You know, the, the very interesting thing about facts is you've got to learn them. The reason they don't know is that they have never, ever thought to think about Ireland in the context of a normal, reasonably well-off European country. Now, first off, the British could do enormous damage to Ireland. For example, John, 70% of all British beef imports come from Ireland. So the agricultural sector, particularly the beef sector, is caught up with the UK. Another area they could really affect us is on what we call the land bridge. 477,000 individual freight containers go from Ireland every year through English ports to the EU. That's about 80% of all our EU trade goes through the UK. So they could harm us, but they yeah. don't see the big picture. And the big picture is that everyone in Dublin knows that it's only a no, you know, this no deal they talk about. Yeah. It's only no deal for now, right? It's not a viable long-term option for the UK. And the reason is the following. The UK does 50% of its trade with the European Union. It is not a long-term option to erect trade barriers and all sorts of barriers to talent and trade and capital with your long-term trade partner. And consequently, John, I believe that the no deal will only last as long as the chaos at English ports is tolerable by the nation. And that will not be particularly long. So basically, it's only everyone in Dublin understands it's only no deal for now. So we're playing a waiting game with the Brits, OK? But will we be able to handle that? I mean, that's a huge amount of freight going through the UK. Will we be able to handle that? Will we stick that out? Look, I'm not saying it's not going to be a massive shock initially because it will depend on how quickly the Brits decide that a no deal is untenable. Mm -hmm. But you've got to look at the huge picture here. The big picture here is that Ireland used to be incredibly dependent on the UK. It is still dependent on the UK as a transport link to the rest of the world. But right now, Ireland is so decoupled from the UK. If you just take the big, big picture, right? In this 
50s scenario, pre-European Union, we were doing almost 100% of our trade with the UK. We now do 11% of our exports with the UK. So Ireland has diversified profoundly from the United Kingdom. And yeah. this is the crux of the issue. Interestingly, the United Kingdom has not diversified profoundly from Ireland. Ireland, little Ireland, of only four and a half million, is the British's sixth biggest export market in the world. The British export right. almost twice as much to Ireland as they do to China. Wow. Right. Okay. Think about that. They also run the second biggest trade surplus that Britain has is with Ireland. They sell us about 18 billion more than we buy from them. So if you think about it, if they were to strangle Ireland, given that they sell us more than we sell them, they would suffer more. Sure. Yeah. Because ultimately they are selling us more. So it makes no sense for them. And then you can think, well, why does Ireland end up buying more stuff than England? Why does Ireland end up importing more stuff from the United Kingdom, nearly twice as much as China does? And the reason is that Ireland's rich. Ireland is much richer than the United Kingdom. How much richer? What kind of thing are you talking about there? Since 1990, if you go back to Irish income per capita, and this is on what's... This is on the most conservative estimates, which takes out all the multinationals and all the distortions, right? In 1995, Irish income per capita was €13,934. Right. By 2018, it's €40,655. That's a growth of 192% in that short period. That's incredible. The UK, in contrast, had a per capita income of about £21,716 in 1995, which was about €24,000. It now has an income per head of £30,594, again, about €32,000. That's a growth of 41%. So Ireland per head is growing five times faster than the UK every year, and already our income is about 25% greater than the UK. So what the Brexiteers don't understand is that Ireland is a much richer country and richer countries can actually deal with shocks better. Now, how did Ireland become much richer? This is what they don't understand. And the reason is that Ireland is a profoundly globalised economy. Yeah. And this, again, is in contrast to their view of Ireland, which is a diddly eye, you know, potatoes, beer and biscuits, top of the morning, place that's totally dependent on Ireland. One, we do about one in 10 of our exports with the UK. If you go back to history, John, when, in, when Britain pulled out of Ireland in the 1920s, we forget that they, not only did they take their government with them and their soldiers and their army and whatever, they yeah. took their money with them too. They took their capital. So the Irish state had no capital. So once you've no capital, there's nothing you can do. You can talk about independence all you like. You can shout and roar about the fact that you've got a flag. But if you've no capital, you can't do anything. Yes. So consequently, yeah, yeah. from 1920 to 1980, Ireland has no capital. We've great aspirations, but we've no capital. Why? Because the capital was largely British and it was taken out. And it took us a long time to twig, okay, how do we get capital into the country if we don't have it and it's not our own? So how did this change? Well, this is where the EU comes in, right? Small countries always, John, have to try and escape the tyranny of geography, the tyranny of the size of your own market. You have to figure out, can we trade with somebody else? Because you don't get rich by trading with yourself when there's only four and a half million of you or you're stuck on to the British economy, which is in decline. Yeah. So part of the going into the EU was this idea is, can we seek links with the richer continental Europeans? And the question was, A, can we do it? And B, do we have the industry? So A, we could do it, but we didn't have the industry to do it because we didn't have the capital. And that's where the American multinationals come in. So what happened was by changing the tax system, we say to the Americans, you come in here, we're going to make this a trading outpost. We're going to turn this country into something like the Shanghai off the coast of Europe yeah. between 1870 and 1950-odd. We're going to make it easy for you to trade. We're going to make it cheap for you to trade. And people complain about the multinationals, but John, if you don't have capital, you have to get somebody else's capital or you condemn yourself for generations of poverty. How right. do you get somebody else's capital? You make it cheap 
for them to invest capital in your country. How do you do that? You actually make it tax efficient. That's the unfortunate iron rule of economics. We did that. And then you begin to see the fruits of this coming through in the 1990s, where Irish trade patterns begin to diversify profoundly from the United Kingdom, like profoundly, begin to be much more European, begin to become much more global, all driven by this tactical switch away from agriculture into multinational investment, which is the new form of industrialization. And it has worked profoundly positively. So as a consequence of that, England, which used to be almost 90% of our exports, is now 11% of our exports. So we've diversified away from the slow UK economy onto the much, much faster growing European economies. And how this trickles down is it trickles down into income per head. So what you've seen is Irish income per head rising in the last 25 odd years by a factor of 192%, whereas English income per head rising by 41%. Take that together and Ireland ends up increasing its capacity five times every year more than the UK. So that is what the Brexiteers are dealing with, and they haven't chosen to inform themselves of those facts. So therefore, they think we are much more fragile than we are, right? The second thing is, John, what really these days drives economics is human capital, brain power, people, not industrial capital. We're in a world of capitalism without capital. And by that, I mean, you don't need huge amounts of capital to expand a business. You take a company like Spotify, it has no capital. It's got a huge business. Why? It's got brain power. So therefore, look at the education system and compare Ireland to Britain now. In the old days, the British were much more educated than we are. Today, Mm -hmm. twice as many English kids leave school without qualifications as Irish kids. Over 10% of English kids leave school early with no qualifications at all. Sorry, that's the leave after the junior cert or after the the O-levels, whatever it is. Yeah, they don't go to university, right? Uh, 5% of Irish kids don't sit the leaving cert. So already at the young age, you're seeing a totally different uh, educational profile. If you look into, for example, our generation, what you see is that the between 25 and 50 odd in Ireland, 56% of people have university education as opposed to 46% of British people. Right. So the education system is much more encompassing of people here. But the more important thing, John, is that part of Brexit is to throw up barriers to educated immigrant workers. They don't want them. Yes, of course. So yeah. we are open to talent. Our own labor force is becoming more educated. We are open to capital. And as a consequence of that, if you're open to capital and talent, your chances of the economy growing stronger are much, much, much higher. And this, again, is something that the Brexiteers don't get. So you're saying that the economic changes and social changes go hand in hand? I I think, John, that you can't separate them. I think the economy and the social change in the last 30 years are inseparable. So now, for example, Ireland has, it's amazing, the Brexiteers don't understand it. We have more immigrants per head than the United Kingdom, yet we have no anti-immigrant party yet. We have no anti-immigrant politician yet. So we have more immigrants per head. Our own leader is an immigrant, the son of an immigrant. He's an openly, he's a gay man. This would never have happened 20 years ago in Ireland. We've had two referendums, one on abortion, as you know, one on gay marriage in the last 24 months, 36 months. Both of them have shown overwhelmingly that the country is liberal. In fact, John, looking around the world, Ireland's a bit of an outlier. While the rest of the world is going more illiberal, more populist, we are becoming more open and more liberal. And that is linked to the upswing in the economy. Because as you become more open, you become more questioning. As you become more questioning, this has its expression in what I would call commercial self-expression. You begin to take more risks, you feel more confident about the future, and you begin to encourage the type of people that take risks, the type of people who want an open society to come and live in the society, and they add to the positive social economic dynamism. So yes, John, I don't see any conflict. In actual fact, I see the economy going economically liberal and the society going socially liberal as one and the same movement. 
okay, I get the fact that we're a stronger economy. We're much more resilient than we ever were before. But if this no deal Brexit goes through, what kind of damage could it do to the Irish economy? So, John, it's, it's very, very hard to quantify immediately. But what I want to do is look at the medium term, right? Yeah. Small countries live and die by the quality of their strategic thinking. That is much, that's the difference between small countries and big countries. Big countries can blunder around the place. Small countries have to be really crystal clear about what their strategic thinking is. You look at all the evidence, the strategic thinking from Ireland is that diversifying away from the UK was a very good thing. It has generated enormous income, quality of life, etc. It's not perfect, as we all know in Ireland, and we can talk about that, but it's not bad, and it's a lot better than where we came from. Okay. So if we were to throw our lot, because what the Brexiteers want us to do is throw our lot back in with the UK, that's the long-term strategy. That would be a total disaster for us. So now what we've got to do is think, can we tolerate the shock to agriculture and the shock to trade that would happen if Britain closed itself off in a no deal? Yeah. And what we've got to assume, therefore, is that Britain will actually do much more damage to itself than it will to us. Because while a lot of our exports to the EU go through the UK, the vast majority of our exports go to the United States. The vast majority. So it's got nothing to do with the UK. Okay. So it will be a lopsided impact. But clearly the strategy has to be, where is our long-term interest? Well, so just on that then, Mac, given that we're getting a lot of stick for being inflexible and not engaging in negotiations and stuff. But where does that leave us now? Like, is there a last minute deal to be done? Or is there something that we could do to break the deadlock? Well, John, actually, I do think there is something we can do. Because remember, we're talking about the big picture. What is probably more egregious to us than anything else is the fact that our cargo trade or manufacturing trade goes through the UK rather than to the UK. So what's most important for us is to keep those borders open. Because the big fear is that the UK self-imposed blockade blocks our freight trucks from going through all those big English ports on the east of England. Now, because the Brits are always talking about the Second World War in this, let's keep the Second World War analogy going. Do you remember the Berlin blockade? Yeah. Which was the Soviet effort in 1948 to blockade West Berlin yeah. from all Western goods, in a sense to strangle West Berlin. And the Americans and the Brits said, no, we're going to airlift in. Yeah. The airlift went on for two years, very expensive. And then eventually the Soviets backed down. But what it led to was a corridor, a Berlin corridor, which was a motorway going from, three motorways actually, going from southwest, west, and northwest Germany to Berlin, which were basically like open access lines from West Berlin to West Germany. And that, in a sense, was a lifeline from Berlin to West Germany. So imagine we said to the Brits, look, you have to guarantee for us safe and secure passage for Irish registered trucks on a separate lane through your ports. Because at the moment, what happens is the Irish trucks are mingled with the English trucks and everybody's stopped and therefore the Irish trucks get caught in this blockade. In return, we will talk to you about whether or not we can make the backstop more acceptable to your people. Right, okay. And so consequently, what we do is we change something on the backstop. Maybe it's time, maybe it's wording, etc. Yeah. And in return, we get safe passage for Irish trucks. So therefore, the land bridge stays open exclusively to our trucks. And okay. irrespective of what the Brits do in the future, Ireland has open access to the European markets yeah. via this yeah. What I would call it a bus lane yeah, yeah, for Irish yeah. trucks that can be technologically implemented very, very easily. That could be a way. Because what we have to do is we've got to actually regard ourselves as an enlightened West Berlin in a sea of atavistic East Berlin and East German thinking. That's what we have to think of ourselves at when it comes to ourselves and the Brexiteers. Now, long term, John, there's really nothing we can do to stop the Brits if they really want to go down this crash out, no deal, rule Britannia way. Sure. We could have this little twist, which would help us have open access. But ultimately, if they, basically, if they surround themselves in the flag, 
Yep. There's not much we can do. Sure, of course. Yeah. But as Irish people, in fairness, we kind of understand that yearning for sovereignty and independence and identity. We, we get all that stuff. I, I, I get that yearning. But to my British friends, I would say just one word of warning. The first 70 years are the hardest. After that, it kind of gets easy. Thanks very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. Now, before we let you go, I want to give you a sneak preview of some premium content which you can access via Patreon. What you have in Venezuela is, in essence, a narco-terrorist state. You have a state that has basically strangled all private enterprise, strangled all you know, international relationships, apart from a few countries like China and Russia and so on, activities. In Cuba, we'll talk about Cuba as yes, well. Yes, as well. And you, and you have relations in Venezuela. Mm, yeah, oh yes, lots. And, you know, this, the government, in, starting with Chavez and now with Maduro, has, has ruined the economy in order to make people dependent on the state, hungry, so they can't go out and protest because they're busy trying to figure out how to feed themselves and their children for the next day. And so it is a state that has reduced people to abject poverty. And this is a country with the highest level of crude oil reserves in the world, as we know reduce people to abject poverty and desperation in order to control them and manipulate them and keep them oppressed. If you enjoy that, you can hear the full episode and much more by joining us on Patreon, which is patreon.com forward slash David McWilliams.